Why don't we begin as people are uh, are joining because we want to have time with our wonderful guest and our and our uh, homegrown talent uh, today. So uh, I'm Chris Byrer. I'm the uh, associate director for the Johns Hopkins Center for AIDS Research and also the director of the Center for Public Health and Human Rights, which are co-sponsoring this event in which we are so delighted to have a dear friend and longtime colleague. Uh, Emily Bass, who has written a really wonderful new book just out this fall, To End a Plague, America's Fight to End AIDS in Africa. And this is really about the, the origin and the backstory and the people story of the, the creation, the establishment of PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which as we all know, is the largest single commitment to a single disease by a government in history. Uh, it may now have been superseded by COVID fun funding. It certainly will be within a few years. But to date, uh, it has really been the most significant contribution. And one for which uh, many of us uh, have been involved, remember the time before PEPFAR, during the rollout, uh, all the many issues that were involved and, and now have come to a place where uh, it is so absolutely a part of the landscape, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that is where uh, Emily has done so much uh, of her work and her research. I just wanna say, I'm, I'm only partially through the book. It is an absolutely wonderful read. Um, uh, everyone in our field really, really uh, ought to read it. And I think we'll find it deeply meaningful uh, and impactful. Uh, but also just to say that, you know, we're, we're living in a world of short attention spans of, of the Twitter sphere of short, short social media posts. And there is really something profound to be said for journalists, for writers who have followed a story for decades, right? This is 40 years into this pandemic, the HIV pandemic, this year is the 40th anniversary. It's a long arc. There are multiple stories. There have been long periods. The most painful period was that those years just before PEPFAR was created when we had antiviral therapy from 1996 and most of the world didn't have it and the dying in Africa was continuing. Extraordinary period. It's now happily a part of the past, although we still have a long way to go. And I think that Emily really is one of the people, and there are not too many left, uh, John Cohen may be another, who have had fidelity to this story and have followed it with attention and passion and integrity and really dug deep. Uh, and part of the beauty of the book is, is that depth, that length of commitment and experience. And it's also uh, part of the power of it because um, she's brought her own voice and her own story uh, to the table. Uh, and that is incredibly powerful. I have to say that for those of us uh, not in the advocacy journalism world, uh, not in the historical world, but rather in the research world, uh, it is really special to have Maria Wayward with us because she too is somebody who has been at this with the same passionate attention, uh, scientific rigor, commitment for decades, for decades. And the Rakai cohort uh, stands as the longest standing community cohort in Africa. Um, it has generated countless vital insights uh, it continues to be uh, a source of extraordinary information. And again, in the, in the depth, in the granular, detailed, long-term commitment that you only see when somebody has really given their life to a body of work. Um, and so we're all deeply in your debt. Everybody working in HIV is in, is in the debt of Maria and Ron and their extraordinary colleagues, David Sirwata, and so many others, uh, the, the wonderful Rakai team that they have collaborated with for all these decades and built and sustained. Uh, and then, of course, they have also done that critical thing, which is mentoring and bringing along the next generation. Uh, and prominent in that next generation is Larry Chang, who, uh, you know, really has brought implementation science uh, to Rakai, has brought his uh, generation's commitment, scientific rigor, intensity, 
uh, and, uh, and has really continued to make those contributions. And happily, he is part of a whole cohort of Ugandan researchers. And I will just say in my own small way, having run the Fogarty program for a number of years, we trained a lot of those people at Hopkins happily, and they have done us all proud. Um, so uh, with that, let me just say that what we're going to do is we're going to begin with Emily reading from this wonderful book. Um, she's going to highlight two of the components of the book that really specifically relate uh, to Rakai and to Uganda, where some of her most profound experiences really occurred. Uh, and Uganda, of course, has been at the center of PEPFAR really from the beginning. Um, and then we're going to have responses from Maria. Uh, and then Larry, and then we will open it up to all of you because I, I can see from who's on the phone that there are many people uh, who also have been at this uh, most of their careers. Um, Ron is with us happily, um, the kind of the, the uh, pater familias of the whole Rakai undertaking. So we're, we're honored to have you with us, Ron. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, my friend, uh, my colleague, the uh, distinguished AIDS journalist and writer, Emily Bass. Oh, Chris, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And it's, it's just a complete pleasure to be here in this particular community. Um, it, one of the things your book, when you publish your book, then it leaves you, it's a little bit like seeing your ex out in the wild. Um, and then and then you get to get back together with it when you get to do these readings. So it's there's there's that part of it. But this particular, I just want to, I'm going to read a little bit. Um, and then I want to get to the conversation because this is a book that, that um, has relevance um, that, that I think I, I wish it didn't have, right? Because we're talking about the history of a, a long running investment in and transnational collaboration on fighting a pandemic, um, uh, which is precisely what we need to figure out. And frankly, I don't think are doing right now um, as the US government when we look at global COVID. So there's, there's relevance. Um, I, I wanna name and, and hold uh, in the light uh, folks in Uganda, Uganda uh, in general at this moment um, uh, with the, the trauma and terror of the bombings, with the trauma and terror of ongoing COVID, um, with all of us, you know, virtually um, assembled because of a uh, pandemic that's affecting all of us in different ways and just hold light for that. Um, Uh, I wrote this book about Uganda because of the Rakai project. So I, I will start that. And it was the Rakai project uh, when I visited there for the first time in 2000. Uh, I had been working for uh, Out Magazine, which got bought by HIV, it got bought by The Advocate. And they said, well, you can keep your job uh, if you want to move to the West Coast. I did not. I'm a New Yorker. Um, but we got to keep our tickets to the Durban AIDS conference uh, in 2000. And um, I met there the editor of the IAVI report who Patricia Khan, a great journalist uh, and medical writer in her own right. And sh they needed a story about the Rakai project and its vaccine cohort. And I spent a few months in South Africa reporting um, in a country that was at that point gripped in really terrifying um, denialism um, uh, the epicenter of a pandemic, but also of, of, um, of the politics, right, of public health, the politics of, of messaging, um, you know, activists with the ability to, to procure antiretrovirals, not being sure if they should because the president meant a lot as well. So a deeply, deeply political environment as all public health is practiced in, in political environments and, and went to Uganda um, to report the Rakai project story at the end of uh, in September 2000, um, and and um, before uh, I'd reached Kampala from from Entebbe, um, kind of knew that I was going to end up uh, spending time in this place, um, and really knew it after the trip down to the Rakai project um, uh, in a very very rattling car uh, pickup truck, and uh, David Sarwada called ahead to make sure that there were mandazi waiting for us, so at least there were fried donuts at the end of the trip. Um, but, but that was really, um, you know, for a, for a, a white New Yorker AIDS activist, um, getting a glimpse of, of what the world looks like, um, 
beyond the protests and beyond the principles, um, going to Rakai and seeing the cohort in, in action at that time and seeing the community health workers in action at that time um, and, and also being in a country where there was enormous political will and collaboration and it was a very different response to the pandemic. Um, uh, those things together, that trip in 2000 are why when PEPFAR and the Global Fund started, I, I moved uh, to Uganda, um, even though um, there were some people that told me not to. Um, if you want to find out who precisely, you can read the book. Um, I was warned off, um, but, uh, but I, I persevered and I'm really glad that I did um, for many reasons. And, and I'm also really grateful uh, to the Rakai Project, because which the very High Health Sciences program when I got down there um, because they they um, listened to what I wanted to do and they and they agreed that I, I what I wanted to do was to visit um, clinics around the country um, uh, that had different service delivery models and different approaches and and lo and behold though I didn't know it at the time they had different um, U.S. funding agencies I had no idea that USAID and CDC had different approaches to the world. Again, this is what you don't know if you're looking at PEPFAR from, from the US, right? It atomizes in a way when you get, so anyway, I wanted to go different places and, I, and what do you do? You go call up people you know. And um, I was lucky enough to know Maddie Kidugavu. I was lucky enough to know the Rakai investigators. I had in, interviewed David Sirwada and Professor Webberry Mangan and Nelson Sewan Combo and was welcomed. Um, and so I spent a year going down to Rakai often when I could, when I was lucky in, in Steve's um, car, but not always. Um, and, uh, and then going out uh, in the field with the team. And I did that for, for a year or two and then would make periodic visits back between, now we're talking 2005 to 2019. And so I was able to see a program um, grow and flourish and see its interface with, um, with PEPFAR as it evolved and the Global Fund and the Ugandan government response. And so I'm telling you all of this because there, there, this is the you, many of you worked on or at or touch Rakai and this is, this is the reason that, the, that I wrote this book. So it's, I wanna read some sections that, that give back a little bit of that. Um, one of the things writers can do is, is capture things that mean something to them, but obviously to, to you as well. So I'm going to read a couple of sections, and then I hope what we'll end up being able to talk about is, um, right, where are we? You know, what this vast swath of time, where are we right now? And what are these things that we have learned along the way and built that you have built, you know, wh where does it leave us? And what are the, you know, I often think, you know, more and more these days as I look back at the history of this, you know, largely successful pandemic uh, response, um, Am I looking back because I want reassurance or am I looking back because I think there's something there that we can build on? And so I'm looking forward to that. But I'm gonna just start with a, a, little, a little bit of an ode to Kampala um, and, then, and then we're gonna go to Rakai. Does that sound good? And then we're gonna go to Rakai in the future. We're gonna do some time traveling and then we're gonna talk. So this is the beginning of chapter seven which is called Small Heavens. Kampala, like the country for which it is the major metropolis appears to be easy to know. It ranges over seven hills, several topped with landmarks that also tell the country's history. Malago Hospital, Makarere University, the Baha'i Temple, one of seven in the world. The largest palace of the King of Uganda sits on top of Mango Hill behind a round brick fence, close to the Anglican Cathedral that has adorned Namarembe Hill since the early 20th century, turning its red brick face in the direction of the royal dwelling of the British favored clan. In the oldest parts of town like Mango and Old Kampala, dun-colored two-story buildings with overhanging balconies shading the sidewalk bear the year of construction and the occasional, occasional Hindu symbol for Om in the crenellation at the top of the facade. One can drive through the streets and by learning the landmarks have the illusion of also learning history. The city that I arrived in on October 24th, 2004 was also easy to traverse on foot. When I walked down from the Makere University campus to Bomba Road and thence to Malago Hospital, I threaded down a narrow pedestrian street of three-walled shops that stretched up from Wandegea Market. Nail salons, clothing stores, purveyors of all things plastic, from baskets to sandals to the basins that students needed to do their laundry, sold their wares out of tiny ordered spaces. Alleys behind those stores led to more and smaller businesses like Professor Chikati, whose name meant what now? 
who had a phone booth sized wooden stall in a charcoal brazier studded courtyard used by a local restaurant in which he hand cranked a well-oiled contraption that emitted a metallic scream as it copied my keys. When expats said, as they often did, Kampala is a village, they were referring to the grazing animals and the maize that grew in plots next to office blocks. They meant too that for all its sprawl, it had a sense of intimacy and safety. One could move from the alley into the rear courtyard without crossing an invisible border, demarcating here from there, poverty from wealth, public from private, safe from unsafe. And these words are poignant to read now because, because I think that's changing, right? White Westerners like me felt secure going almost anywhere. In Nairobi, whose verdant streets had a darker evergreen hue, the shift from an NGO office adjacent to the Kabira slum where the packed dirt was shot through with plastic bags was so extreme that it was like jumping off a cliff. In Nairobi, carjackings were common and the far superior sidewalks around the downtown and hotels were often deemed unsafe for morning jogs. Kampala hid modern conveniences like treasures amid its dirt roads and sprawling outdoor markets. There was for a time a payphone in the post office on Kampala Road across from the creamy white facade of the Barclays Bank that was unlabeled. And when the receiver was lifted, immediately connected to an international line from which you could use your calling card. It's really true. It was just there. It's like this magical phone. The phone was singular, like many of the city's amenities at the start of the 21st century. The lone expat sports bar just kicking and the man in the parking lot outside with a basket full of DVDs of movies that had not yet been released overseas. You could set the metal receiver in its cradle and in less than an hour be at the side of Lake Victoria where the noise of frogs and birds at the start of the day was a cacophony that made me think time and again and despite a sharp-tongued post-colonialist critique of my own musings of Eden. I woke to these noises most weekends when I traveled out to my expats' friends' lake houses, Mark Brita's and Munyonyo and Leslie Nielsen's ferry house on stilts in Bunga, both technically suburbs of Kampala where houses with coveted mature gardens of tall trees and thick flowering bushes turned their faces toward the lake. Many of my friends worked in offices in Malago Hospital in the jumble of buildings housing Ugandan collaborations with international groups that studded Malago Hospital's campus. There was a little white building with the outside staircase that housed the Case Western Reserve University project where many of my expat friends worked on tuberculosis and other diseases with Dr. Rory Mugerwa and Dr. Harriet Mayanja. Steps away sat the headquarters of the McCary University Johns Hopkins University project led by Dr. Francis Miro and Dr. Philip Omusoke. Down at the bottom of the hill in a 1960s era building with a facade not unlike a Miami Beach hotel, the Institute of Public Health housed Dr. David Sirwata, Dr. Nelson Sewankambo, and Dr. Fred Wabiri Mangan, the trio of researchers who'd established the Rakai Health Sciences Program in the Southern District where some of the earliest Ugandan cases were identified. So that's a little bit of, of intro. And, and there is a, a lot of, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a different section of the book. There's a lot of expat love in, in that section and, and uh, name it, Uganda is a great place to live and work and it always has been. And, um, and the, the global North love affair with Uganda is wrapped up in that. There is a, there is a Fantasia, but it's not just, it, it also was true for Ngugi Watiango when he arrived there by train um, to go to university, to Makari University. And that's a bit in the book is describing the sense of leaving a truly uh, a colony with, with um, unseated land that was being farmed by, by white farmers and crossing into Uganda. And, and the way that he describes it, it almost sounds like entering Oz. So, so there, is, there is a romance that, that, that cuts both ways. What does it mean to be the country that is uh, the favorite? What does it mean to be the country where things are supposed to work, where everything you put in the ground grows, right? Maybe we'll come back to that. So what I want to do when I get there is uh, is just go sit in clinics. Um, and so in November 2004, I secured an invitation to visit the Rakai Health Sciences Program headquarters in Kalisizo and made my way south, taking Masaka Road, which dropped south off the outskirts of Kampala by the lush green of Busega Swamp and a store painted with an advertisement for shoe polish in which a white woman's hands gripped a black loafer. Don't just shine, super shine my shoes. You might remember this. This was one of my favorite advertising campaigns. 
Calisa's always laid out on a simple grid, two main streets bisected by two others, wide and dusty as the thoroughfares and the westerns my father had watched when I was growing up. The morning after I'd arrived, I walked out of the main building and into the dusty intersection, then climbed into a pickup truck loaded with metal footlockers, nurses, and counselors who rotated through the district, bringing the drugs close to the rural impoverished population. We drove to Casasa to a building classified as a health center three, pulling up on a flat packed dirt parking area in front of two buildings set back from the road. One small and covered in dingy cream colored paint was the government clinic staffed by a nurse named Mary, who when I asked her about her drug supplies, picked the bottles off of her small dispensing table and rattled them like castanets so I could hear the thin click of a handful of pills inside. It was November 17th. She'd last received drugs in September. She had the broad spectrum antibiotic metronidazole and for anti-malarials, the colonial remedy of quinine plus 10 tablets of Vansidar. It's perhaps a, enough to treat 10 adults. She had a smattering of mebendazole for treating parasites and worms. She told me she lacked salambutol, which helped with breathing and at least one malaria drug and anything for the sexually transmitted infections that troubled so many of her clients. Of the 30 odd who came to test for HIV, she reckoned 15 were positive. She'd not had conduct since July. The Rakai team took over the other building, which might otherwise have been used as an inpatient ward. It was a long, large, dusty square room whose only source of light came from the door and the square windows looking out on the bright field and brush beyond. The room itself was empty save for what seemed like an enormous number of bed frames, all without mattresses, all made of varnished blonde wood. They stood at the odd and random angles of infrequent use. When the sun went behind a cloud, the room felt submerged, the pale wood seeming to gleam like bones. The Rakai team supplied the rest of the contents, medications for malaria and sexually transmitted diseases, antiretrovirals, antifungals, medical charts and primary colors, a box filled to the brim with powder coated latex gloves. Next door, Mary had told me she had 10 pairs of gloves and a half a roll of cotton gauze and that five women had delivered at the hospital that day. On the Rakai side, I watched a nurse reach for a pair from the overstuffed box that the team had brought. When several others popped out and then drifted like poppy petals to the floor, she scooped them up and shoved them into the trash. The staff worked with a practiced efficiency. Many of them played netball and football together on their Kai Projects teams, and they moved around the clinic with an athletic economy of motion. The physicians that day were Dr. Joseph Kagai, fresh from medical school, and Dr. Porto Kamia, who'd come out of retirement to help start the Rakai antiretroviral treatment program. Kagai, like many young doctors, had encountered a job market filled with demand for HIV physicians. Kamia had lived through the plague years when death was so pervasive that for a time the government tried to ban journalists from visiting the district. Kagai seemed to revel in the medical problems presented by the clients, many of whom had been sick with HIV for a long time. He thought aloud about getting testosterone for one patient who had lost his appetite and grinned at another woman who'd come back for her refill. He had to spend an hour with her to persuade her to take the drugs because another man in her village had started the drugs then died. He held the pills in his hands, little plastic bags marked with suns and moons, and they inclined their heads toward the drugs she decided weren't poison after all. Sawa imisana, sawa ichiro, in the morning at night. He pressed them with one finger, then she reached out and did the same. Their murmuring over those little tablets seemed a prayer, the medicines a Eucharist. The first PEPFAR funded AIDS treatment program that I saw in action, Rakai was in many ways the best and worst of PEPFAR in one, a project literally running in parallel with a government clinic struggling to meet basic needs that had, within months of the money arriving, figured out a way to bring a state-of-the-art care to the rural poor. And that, that is sort of what I struggle with across the book and what we've all struggled with, I think, as we, as we work with PEPFAR um, and we work through and with different approaches to global health and foreign aid is, um, is moving with speed, moving with impact, moving with efficiency and building systems. And we're, we're seeing right now, right, the, um, the impact of both, the, the impact of, of what the systems that we did build, that you built, I just sat there and watched you guys, uh, and also what, what hasn't been built. And I think both of those things are, are profound, but, but what's also profound is that the approaches themselves were not static. Rakai wasn't static, you know that, uh, many of you know that. And if you don't know that, we're just gonna, we're gonna time travel a little bit because, um, because it, it, one of the fascinating things I think as we think about programs and evaluating aid mechanisms and also <laughs> evaluating long-term commitments to fighting pandemics is, is, 
is how do they change over time? What does it mean if you think about PEPFAR not just as Bush's legacy and his speech in January 28, 2003, but as, as Rakai enduring and adapting to different models and different approaches and being resilient and innovative in the face of, um, of changing demands and changing configurations. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna read, we're time traveling, everybody with me? We're gonna, we're, we just, we left uh, 2004 and uh, we're in uh, 2019. And I've gone back to Rakai and everybody's super busy, but they're also really, really nice to me as usual, um, but Steve's not there. So I didn't get to have his good food, but I got my own good food. Um, and uh, I sat down with, um, with an, an information officer named um, Abhisaja Nampija, um, and she'd been assigned to show me around the program. And, um, and we just talked a little bit about how her job had changed and how things had changed um, now that Rakai was really trying to help the district te health teams and help the districts deliver care. So Nampija spent a good portion of her time ensuring that her government counterparts provided quality services to people living with HIV. Clients still came to the Rakai clinic for services. As we talked in her office, I could see women and babies sitting on benches through her open door. But the majority of clients were now seen at government facilities where she relied on local staff and district health teams to work with her to solve problems. It was hard, she said. The district health officers didn't always provide the funds allocated for the clinics. They didn't always show up for events. But once she got a DHT member on her side, it's a district health team, anything was possible. Bringing the data back to the people who served the community got them excited, involved. It was the opposite of what Sister Natalia, this is a, a, a nurse at another program I visited, um, had experienced years prior when she'd been told that her clinic was failing without being given a chance to review the findings or suggest a solution. If you're on good terms with the people down at the community level, then you're good, Napija said. She loved to bring data back to the DHTs and then ask them what they thought was causing a loss of TB patients or a drop in HIV retention. If you get people who are really interested in what they do, ah. Oh, she let out a long, delighted sigh. It makes everything very exciting. When you get DHT members and district, fo district focal persons, even with a little money they get paid, you see how passionate they are when you tell them about performance. In Rakai, I prevailed on a head pharmacist to take me out to Kasasa, where I'd been on one of my first trips in 2005. The pharmacist spent her days fixing errors caused by mismanagement at the government run national medical stores, which had taken over the supply chain a few years prior. PEPFAR Uganda was now, require, now required all of its partners to get their drugs through NMS. It also paid staff at non-governmental organizations like the Rakai Health Sciences Program to troubleshoot the problems with an underfunctioning agency that sent out oversupplies to one place and left stockouts in another. The pharmacist had her laptop open in the van working while we drove and I tried not to interrupt her. She walked me in to meet the local government health worker who ran the antiretroviral clinic. She sat in a barn-like room. A new building had been erected on the property with a wall of shelves behind her. While the health worker chatted with the pharmacist, I looked at the color-coded folders in their neat stacks. It was the same filing and tracking system that Rakai used at its headquarters. Clients who were pregnant in one stack, those who had missed appointments in another, those with detectable viral loads in another, and so on. I knew the pharmacist needed to get back to work, but I allowed myself one reminiscence. There were once all these beds, I said, all these empty wooden bed frames. Oh yeah, the pharmacist replied, then walked me back around to the back of the clinic where a rank of pale blonde mattressless frames sat under the eaves. They're still here. So thank you for listening. Thank you for still being here. Um, thank you for all the ways that you have made this story and are making this story. Um, and I think there are many directions to go, right? I, as a journalist, I always have questions. I see Tom Quinn. I mean, I just really want to name and, and, and show so much gratitude for people who helped launch this project and, and were, and were <coughs> Lisa Mills was sitting uh, beside Kagai when he was getting excited about testosterone. So a real hospitality that, that enabled me to do this work. But, but I think this question of what is still here and what's missing um, is very much on my mind today and maybe a way to um, hand over to my, my um, fellow panelists and speakers and thinkers. And, and just thank you so much for, for listening.
Thank you, Emily. That was a really extraordinary. And um, it's amazing, you know, as we said at the beginning to hear that the long arc, right? And 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 still the work undone. Maria, you you were present at the creation um, and uh, and are still very active and contributing. Um, um, maybe over to you for some some reflections on what you've heard. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you, Emily. I really, really enjoyed your book. It is so comprehensive. At the same time, it's a page turner. And I learned so much from it. You also got, you know, your ability to synthesize both the politics and the social aspects of the early HIV epidemic and then the development of PEPFAR was is really extraordinary. I'd like to <clears throat> reminisce a little bit and go through a couple of points that occurred to me while going through your book, some of which were in your book and some of which I'm going to gratuitously add. Um, one thing that I really appreciate is that you pointed out that Rakai really was, you, you hate the word, I don't like the word either, but the word that was being used was indigenous. That basically it was David Nelson and their colleagues who came up with the idea for a population-based pro project, research project, in the Rakhai region of Uganda, which borders with Tanzania. Um, David, uh, David Sarwada was the first author on the first major paper on HIV to come out of East Africa. And they were incredibly committed. They really wanted to understand what was happening, not just in clinics, but how this you know, strange epidemic was spreading, et cetera. I mean, there was so little known back in the uh, 80s. But, you know, however accomplished they were and however committed, they weren't able to get the funds to actually start a program. Um, they had asked CDC, CDC had punted to USAID, USAID had punted to Columbia University and Columbia University tracked me down while Ron and I were on holiday in Tuscany and said, uh, you're going to Uganda, to which I said, no, they're still shooting people there. The uh, uh, civil war was just coming to an end. Um, but I flew to Uganda and met um, David and Nelson. They were so committed that, you know, it was obvious that Uganda was going to be an incredible place to work with incredible colleagues. But so we started. Um, something that I did want to add, I mean, your book is already over 430 pages, so I can understand why you focused on the politics and social aspects. Uh, and that's a history that desperately needs to be told. But there was also the parallel history of the research that was being done in Uganda, uh, as well as other parts of Africa that undermine everything that PEPFAR is doing these days. You know, the blood, sweat and tears that went into going into doing a, a trial of STD control for HIV prevention, which had negative results. And that was such a blow because we were all convinced that STD control for HIV prevention would have some effects on HIV. And there was absolutely no effect. And our colleagues, we all had to stick together because the blowback from the uh, establishment uh, was, was really very strong. CDC had already started STD programs for HIV control. And here we are saying, uh, guys, it, we don't think it works. And it took multiple years and multiple additional um, trials done in many different settings in Africa to show that unfortunately that was not the way to go. And then there were the trials of male circumcision, which we and, uh, I mean, when I say we, I mean Rakai and two other uh, sites in Africa showed that male circumcision could reduce HIV acquisition by males by over 50%. And you know this was such a slam dunk, but we'd also uh, were hoping that circumcision of positive men might reduce transmission to their partners. And that part of the uh, trial turned out not to be um, successful. Although now we have, <clears throat> excuse me, longer term evidence that circumcision of positive men, you know, once wound healing is complete, might actually be protective. But still, you know, it was a completely hard slog of about 15 years to get those data. And as well as um, a paper that Tom Quinn was first author on from Rakai that showed that uh, 
HIV viral load in a, the positive partner was the main predictor of whether a negative partner would acquire HIV. And that served as the basis for treatment as prevention. And, you know, ART not only as um, uh, obviously life-saving for the, for the index partner, but protective at a, you know, for other partners and at a population level. So, um, and then, we, but as Emily was saying, people were still dying um, all, all around. I mean, in uh, Calisiso, the prevalence rate was 30% HIV prevalence rate. So, mm -hmm. you know, back in the uh, late um, 1980s, you could walk down the street and you realize that every third person, you didn't know which every third person, but every third person was going to have died within 10 years. Um, that was the reality. Um, and uh, among our colleagues, so many lost relatives. Uh, I mean, I can't think of a single one of our colleagues who hadn't lost relatives and was helping to take care of additional children of their lost relatives. Um, so then comes the possibility of doing ART treatment in, in Africa, in Uganda. And I must say, I was a skeptic. I was really worried. At that point, the treatment regimens were still pretty complex. Uh, and I really was not sure that people would be able to stick with the regimens, uh, remember how to take their pills correctly. I wasn't sure that the supply systems would work sufficiently. And thank God I was proven wrong. Uh, at this point, the uh, adherence and the viral load suppression in places such as Rakai are so much better than in most programs in the US. Um, it's, it's really remarkable. It's, it's a real <clears throat> statement of the way our colleagues are really dedicated, but also how appreciative the population is. And I should say with all the research we had done previously, the population was so interested in being part of research. We'd have people coming and saying, why aren't you working in our community and trying to use data from our community as well to try to uh, figure out how to prevent this epidemic. So, you know, between our colleagues and the population, it, it was, it, it's been, you know, quite the trajectory. So what I'd also like to comment on though is, um, the PEPFAR program, as you mentioned, Emily, incredibly successful. And, and Chris, as you were also saying, um, this has been a absolute life-changing program. And you know, to see people now able to live full lives, um, the reductions in stigma, stigma still exists, but the reductions in stigma because of treatment and all of that, that is truly remarkable. But um, PEPFAR, like any program uh, has its problems. And, you know, just to sort of put things into uh, uh, context as Emily was also doing, right now the Rakai program working with Ministry of Health clinics oversees a ART treatment for, for over 120,000 people. And um, the Rakai program trained virtually all the circumcision, uh, the providers of circumcision in the country with again, hundreds of thousands of circumcisions accomplished to, to date. Um, and the Rakai program, as it continues to do its epidemiological research uh, was among the first to show that there was a definitive population-based impact on reducing HIV incidence by three quarters at this point or even 80%. So this was all very uh, positive, but PEPFAR did have its problems. Uh, certainly being data-driven, as you point out in the book, uh, Emily, was a huge part of the program, uh, particularly in its more recent years, where basically uh, the whole point is, let's do what the data show we should be doing. But the data collection became so onerous and our colleagues, they didn't complain to the donors because you don't bite the hand that feeds you. But, you know, in the evenings when they were still up at midnight, trying to make sure that the data were correct, were correct to get them to uh, CDC PEPFAR on a weekly basis 
was so crushing. And, you know, and the danger, and they were very cognizant of this, the danger was with that kind of reporting requirement, you're going to make mistakes. Or there's always the worry that somebody out of sheer desperation is going to start making numbers up. So they were incredibly worried about that and worked ferociously to keep that from happening. But it was an undue burden. You know, it makes me think that had PEPFAR been operating in the US, would anybody have said, you have to provide us with weekly data? Or would they have said, okay, we trust you guys enough that you can do it monthly or maybe quarterly? Uh, well, the CDC so reports about every two years, so. <laughs> <laughs> but but Rakai and all the other implementing agencies in Uganda had to do it exactly weekly, yeah. um, which is really, you know, a little condescending. I mean, really, have you, do you have to monitor that much or can you trust people a little bit? So, um, but again, PEPFAR as a program overall has, has done miracles. Um, okay. I wonder if this would be a good moment, um, Larry, to ask you to, to um, speak a little bit about the present and the future. Uh, you know, where, where you see uh, the efforts going and, and what it looks like also from the implementation perspective. You know, this has really been your area of research expertise. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Maria, and definitely thanks to you, Emily. Um, yeah, I'd like to kind of approach this maybe from a little bit of a different angle. Um, uh, first of all, I thought it was a, a fantastic book and a must read. And it was also a trip down memory lane. And I think one of the existential issues in HIV right now is how do we keep attention on HIV? How do we inspire the next generation? How do we inspire the people like Maria and Chris um, to come? And this book, reading it reminded me of, I think, um, ways in which I was inspired to go into it. And I just wanted to touch upon that briefly because I think there may be some lessons there to how to keep the next generation uh, inspired and involved. And one of them is the book itself. Uh, you know, I was an English major in college and the literature on HIV is amazing and it's moving. You know, things from, and the band played on, nonfiction like Angels in America, My Own Country, et cetera. And I think this book Emily has written is so critical because it fills a huge gap talking about PEPFAR and what had happened in Africa. And I think reading this literature, again, I think this is a must read for anybody interested in this field, really is a really powerful way for people to feel like you're not just doing something on your own. You're really part of history, you're part of a movement. Mm -hmm. And I think that could be very inspiring to future generations. So. I want to thank Emily for writing that book, and I think that's um, uh, something, you know, a, a silver lining in this uh, terrible epidemic has been the amazing works of literature, fiction and nonfiction would have been uh, a part of that. Uh, the second thing is, is definitely role models. There are many on here, uh, Maria, Ron, Tom, etc., who have been incredibly inspiring as I've gone through my career. I've been fortunate to have worked with so many wonderful people like uh, Kevin DeCock, Jim Curran, Stan Vermont, et cetera. And unfortunately, uh, we've lost some role models over the past several years, some to COVID. And I know tragically, uh, uh, Scott Hammer passed away recently, which is a, a terrible loss, a, a very nice uh, inspirational leader. So I really think um, the role models that we have, I think having them uh, be able to reach as many younger people in the field is important. I think we need to tell their stories. I think we need to make sure people um, understand what they did and uh, can continue to be inspired by that. So a, a book like this helps kind of create that uh, monument to them if you want, or at least to kind of show their humanity. And I, I think that's also, uh, at least it was for me, very inspirational and, and something which uh, I think the book helped remind me of. Uh, one other thing the book reminded me and really took me down memory lane is we often think of uh, maybe we spend too much money on conferences or meetings uh, and like, what's the point of that? Uh, but I will say that uh, the AIDS conference in 2000 in South Africa was probably one of the most important uh, moments in, in my life. I was a young medical student there and um, I think going to this meeting really helped change the trajectory of what I wanted to do. 
um, because it really felt like, wow, this is, it was just such a, a, a feeling of being of something bigger than yourself, of a clear uh, social injustice and equity that you could be part of. And I think figuring out how to create a similar sort of movement, a feeling, uh, could be uh, highly inspirational to the, to the next generation. I think that's maybe challenging in the current era, but it was if it's something we could re recreate, could be could be amazing. Uh, particularly from that conference, uh, I don't know who else might have been there, but uh, I remember when when Nelson Mandela was introduced and how the crowd just went absolutely insane. And you know, creating such a moment and having those type of people who can. Uh, inspire uh, entire generations to take on what to some may have seemed like an impossible task at the time. Um, that to me was very inspirational and uh, something I hope to support, you know, future students and trainees, you know, uh, it may just be another meeting to us, but it may be uh, potentially a, a, a life-changing experience for some. Uh, and then the final thing, and, and this is uh, to also kind of build off this idea of kind of the work I do with information science was, was of course getting into, into the field. And we sometimes think, okay, you know, uh, you know, students, they're gonna spend a month or two here, you know, that's not really a lot of time. Is, is that really worth it? Uh, and I must say that, you know, even spending, after spending time in Uganda and Rakai, even the first few weeks, like those were incredibly uh, profound experiences. Um, the first, uh, clinic I was able to work at in Africa was a clinic uh, at Reach Out in Boya, which was mentioned in the book. And that was just an incredibly inspirational place to be. It may have been one of the first PEPFAR clinics in Africa. And just their commitment to a community-based approach, to a holistic approach to the person was hugely influential and, and hugely inspiring. And then working in the field uh, in Uganda, which I first did in, in 2005, uh, you know, starting to think of a new project, they paired me with uh, Joseph Kagai as another young investigator. And getting into the field and starting to work with them, you realize, you know, I'm not here to just necessarily uh, work on HIV, but here's an opportunity to work with these people and as, as equals, as people who you could grow with in terms of your career, and, and we have. And that feeling of you're not, um, of kind of the immense uh, capacity already there, but also the potential. Um, I think those kind of relationships were really uh, inspirational in realizing what was happening on the ground and trying to think of community-based approaches, but also realizing that there was uh, already existing a, a huge resource in our, our colleagues, our Ugandan colleagues to um, be academic, be peers with, and to work together in a consensus um, type of uh, decision-making structure to hopefully uh, make a lot of impact. And, and so that leads to, I think, what is the future of PEPFAR? Uh, and in this era of um, this concepts of the decolonization of global health and so far, I personally think the Rakai is, is I hope it's not an exception, but the way we're able to work in a consensus-based process to take ideas from both sides to come to a consensus on what would have the most impact in the, to the people, I think that could be a potential model for what PEPFAR might look like in the future. So I'll pause there and, and I know we've got a lot of questions and uh, people can maybe also respond. If I could just add one or two things. Uh, thank you, Larry, that, that was excellent. But I think we also have to be cognizant of the fact that PEPFAR in some ways is at a very potentially fragile state. Uh, funding is not growing, funding is decreasing. Uh, population growth in Uganda is such that there are more and more people who require services. I mean, the population has tripled since when I first got there in 87. Um, and that puts tremendous stress on resources, whether it's health, education, et cetera. Um, the other thing is that between COVID and resource constraints, the danger is that if the system starts to break down, then there are literally millions of people throughout Africa 
who are now uh, suppressed, virally suppressed, if they become unsuppressed, we have, we're going to have a wave of HIV, of HIV like we haven't seen before, because it's going to be potentially relatively sudden and people are going to get highly viremic and we're going to be in worse shape than we were in the 1980s. So I think somehow keeping um, donors interested, continuing to work with ministries so that they don't drop the ball, uh, and also to continue being able to do research because the research is what provides the data on what is happening at the population level, whether it's implementation science research, whether it's uh, analyses of clinical data, whether it's population cohorts, and the funding for research is not getting any better. It's actually getting worse. So I think there are some perils we have to be concerned about and do our best to advocate. Thank you. Emily, I'd love to give you a chance to respond. There is a there is a question that relates just to what Maria was speaking to from Kate Grabowski, mm -hmm. another next generation Rakai investigator um, with Larry and Maria and, and the Ugandan uh, leaders. Um, and it's really about, uh, you know, the critique that PEFAR is described as top down or donor driven or vertical program, um, which it is in a way the mother of all vertical programs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and she's really asking what what is the end game or should there even be one? So this really gets to Maria's question about sustainability. Um, and of course, we now have a nominee for the PEPFAR ambassador position, John Nkengasong, a distinguished uh, leader from CDC and now recently head of the Africa CDC. So that at least speaks to this administration's uh, commitment to keep it going. But I wonder what your your view of that is. Um, so I think, you know, there's so many directions to go in. Um, you know, Kate's question, which, you know, is, you know, I wonder your, you know, the thoughts about, you know, this top-down donor-driven program, you know, what are your thoughts and if you think it, it should have been done differently? And, and um, I really thought about that for the entire book, right? I mean, that was a big part, you know, and grappled with it and, and asked people over and over again and asked people, um, who, who I expected um, to have different takes. I mean, particularly, um, for some reason, particularly the South African um, researchers and physicians that I talked to. So Yogan Pillay and, and Francois Venter, um, you know, cause that was a country with a health infrastructure and, and, um, and a capacity. And, and, you know, everybody, it, it really, it, it is, if you were a person with HIV in 2004, PEPFAR probably saved your life. Um, it, it, you know, the, the, I just said it, you know, uh, John Robert Angole was the first uh, person anywhere in the world to take a PEPFAR purchased antiretroviral and it was in, in Reach Out in Buya in, in uh, March or April of, of 2004, um, which if you think about, you know, the State of the Union speech having been given in January uh, 2003, that's, that's lightning speed. And um, the Global Fund grant had been made the year prior and nobody had taken a PEPFAR purchased antiretroviral. And so, you know, the easy part of the answer is should it have been done differently in 2004? I, and I don't think it should have. I think that at that moment, um, there, was a, there was a crisis, there was a raging pandemic and we're talking about years of neglect at that point, right? Eight years since 1996 and, and triple combination therapy um, of, of, you know, grotesque inequity, which we're living through today. So at that moment, um, it's the program it needs to be. I think the real question is, is, you know, do you continue the way that you started and what could be built differently or what, in what ways was it built differently in different places? And, and I know that, that um, I, I feel that in my body, the soul crushing data requirements that, that Maria was describing. I feel that, you know, that I've seen that, that this, just the screws put on, on clinics and programs and, um, and been at some DC based meetings that that um, people in the hallway might or might not have compared to the Hunger Games, um, where where programs are sort of being evaluated. Um, and what I was really struck by in my last reporting trip in 2019 was that um, 
that that David um, and and uh, and Tasso, you know, who the, which was at that point run by Bernard Etikoy, um, but these so-called indigenous partners, and even JCRC was bringing brought back on the the funding arrangements that had been set up by CDC and the ways that groups had autonomy and some of the things that were done specifically in Uganda. Um, allowed for a resilience and a flexibility that, that is so detailed, it's sort of so micro, Scott, micro level that it, it may or may not be relevant. But, but I do think a lot as we're going into a crisis mode now, we're going to have to do something large scale around global COVID and around other global pandemics. It's not just the vaccines, it's syringes and healthcare workers and messaging. And I mean, it's all the things you know about and you're working on. And so it, it, and we have yet to sort of see that with targets and, and logistics and infrastructure and all of those things put in place. And some of it, I think, is going to have to be similar in the sense of it's whoever's able to do it fastest. And what can we learn from PEPFAR about how to make investments that build a more resilient health system? Um, so I get, in, I ask, get asked this question not infrequently, and I always kind of slide around it. Um, that, that was today's slide, today's skate, um, but I welcome other people's thoughts on that. Certainly, we've all lived with it. Um, I, I mean, I think the other thing about an end game for PEPFAR, right? God, I would have answered this question differently two years ago. I really would have, um, you know, uh, I, I just, we are, we are as, as Maria said, we are, we are at such a moment of crisis for HIV, for tuberculosis, for uh, you know, unplanned pregnancies, for, for a whole wave of things that we don't even have the data for yet that are coming and we know they're coming, right? Um, that are related to COVID, to loss of income, to the shutdown of informal economies, to people being pulled out of schools, to constrained movement. And, and so in that context, it, there, with the idea of a resurgent crisis, um, not an HIV has been a crisis. It's the president's emergency plan for AIDS. It's been an emergency for 20 years, but, but with this heightened emergency, I believe we still need a really well-funded program, especially because this is, as, and Chris will speak to this or can, and, and is, is you know one of our, our global leaders in this space, but this is an epidemic of key populations who are despised by the governments in, in the countries where, where PEPFAR, some of the countries where PEPFAR operates. And for, if for no other reason, you know, between, between that and, and the, the continued, um, you know, uh, profound global fear of women's bodily autonomy in the places where PEPFAR can intervene and offer space for key populations and for women's control of their, their bodies, um, it has a function. Right, but that it's an imperfect solution to a deeply flawed world. So those are my how, thoughts. I welcome others. How how would you have answered this question two years ago? Because you said now your your thinking has changed I, in some ways. I mean, at two years ago, we were we were heading towards quote unquote epidemic control, right? Um, you know, which again that we could have a whole seminar on on what that really is, but. Um, the, the push to indigenous organizations within PEPFAR well complex was in some places beginning to, um, I think beginning to give a sense of sort of a, a nationally driven program. And I think we really could have looked at more and more and more, um, what would, what would a global fund resourced space look like? What would it look like to build this into universal health coverage? If you can cast your mind back, that's where we were was UHC. Um, you know, now it's global pandemic preparedness, but we were really trying to integrate. Um, and I think that, you know, a, 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 a PEPFAR that perhaps was focused on the implementation science, perhaps focused on finding the innovations that could be translated, perhaps focused on key populations. I think we were looking at, I was looking at a moment where, where a, a much different sized and scoped program seemed um, conceivable. Yeah, I'll just reflect that we we um, recently had, uh, so I've been uh, appointed to the uh, PEPFAR Scientific Advisory Board, um, which I had served on under Eric Goosby, but uh, not under Debbie Burks. Um, so I'm back on that, which is a pleasure. And we just had a, you know, a 
couple of day meeting with updates on, on the program and what we know about the impacts of COVID and how that was going. Um, and it's really striking, you know, that, that um, the vaccine coverage in the PEPFAR focused countries for COVID-19 is poor. Uh, and the, the platform, you know, has not been sufficiently leveraged, I think, to, to address that. And that is, a, that is a great missed opportunity, it seems to me, particularly because, you know, we know that people with HIV should be prioritized for immunization. And, you know, uh, so one of the data points, for example, was the only PEPFAR-focused country in our hemisphere is Haiti. Uh, and the COVID vaccine coverage is under 1% of adults. Uh, so, you know, I think I think the um, short answer, in a way, is there's no escaping more integration, right? And and also that we really need those resources. The other data point that was so sort of painful but important was that people really did a magnificent job of not having treatment interruptions during COVID, and I think. That just speaks to the resilience of the people on the ground and their ability to adapt and everybody, you know, having in their bones the idea that we should not have treatment interruptions. Uh, but there were treatment interruptions and they most disproportionately affected people over age 50, PEPFAR recipients uh, of older age. And that is, of course, because older age people were very vulnerable and were being told to avoid healthcare facilities and, and voted with their feet. Uh, but you know, those are the people who need to be prioritized for COVID immunization. So in a way they ought to be the last to, you know, to, have, to have suffered those outcomes. So we're gonna spend years understanding the impact uh, of this new pandemic on the previous one. Um, and obviously uh, for most of Africa, um, you know, we're still really in the thick of, of low vaccine access and, and hesitancy. Um, there's no question that um, I think for PEPFAR to survive and, and thrive, uh, it has to demonstrate to the countries and to the, to the clients um, that, uh, you know, that the program is there for them and, and is responsive to COVID. Uh, absent that, I think it will be very hard. And as we know, there are resentments out there driven to some degree by the data, to, to some degree by, um, you know, what had been a very ferocious uh, focus on program outcomes. I, I guess the only other thing I would say in terms of the data is, you know, it, it's, it's onerous to demand regular reporting. You better be sure you're collecting the right data and you're forcing people to spend all their time on measures that matter. <laughs> that also has been a problem. Right, and, and uh, I think also one that we're hoping uh, under John's leadership, we can, we can reform. I think one thing, and I, I would welcome people to weigh in um, and put questions in the chat. So please, please interrupt me um, or, or just come off mute. Um, but I think one thing that, that is, um, has been on my mind a lot is that, um, you know, PEPFAR has, if you, if you compare and contrast PEPFAR and Global Fund statements, stances on approaches to COVID, they've been remarkably different. And, and you know, um, in terms of engaging, in terms of calling it a crisis, right? I mean, Peter Sands is out there saying this is, you know, they just, the, the, the day that they issued their, um, their 20th status report, you know, and they said, we really thought this was gonna be a celebration. And in fact, we wanna call a global warning. Um, PEPFAR, um, you know, tweeted something totally, you know, legitimate, but about needing longer clinic hours for, for male patients, which is also true, but it, it's, a, it's a real study in contrast, right? So thinking, why is that, right? And, and, and you know, I think I'd be curious what other people's analyses are, but one of the things is um, um, a moment that actually started when our current president was vice president, so in the Obama-Biden administration, is that PEPFAR's funding is flatlined and it is, it is very much told to stay in its lane. Yeah. Um, uh, it is it is a program that that in 2009, um, you know, is is um, several times um, is is sort of almost moved into USAID, almost moved into the Global Health Initiative, with a with a net reduction in in its annual budget um, and a proposal to sort of 
to do more diverse health systems integrated funding, but without or programming without additional resources. And for the AIDS activist community, which which included scientists, researchers, um, you know, Rakai staff members, people living with HIV, I mean, people talk about, you know, somewhere in the chat, you know, is, is when did we get the 052 results? I mean, that changed the game, right? PEPFAR was, was in the doldrums. And then suddenly we had the clinical data that treatment was prevention and, and um, a program that actually hadn't had a treatment target, right? It was, PEPFAR was, was, was functioning without a new treatment target and, and President Obama came out and, and um, we had um, 6 million by 2013, and that was the direct result of activist pressure. But, you know, in thinking about why, why is PEPFAR, you know, you know, it'll say things like malaria is part of health security, but, but it's not tackling COVID head on. And it, it up until recently, think, Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think, you know, authorization of use of funds for COVID vaccine administration is really, is really ring fenced, but I don't know if it's to staff training and, um, you know, that is, that is a product of history and of political forces and of, and of, um, decision-making, um, including by people that are still influential, um, so in this, in this administration. And so I think in, in trying to predict the future, I'm also cog always just looking back to the past to understand. Yeah. 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 Well said. Well, I, I, um, I, I've been monitoring the chat and uh and wonderful to see um uh you know people's responses uh, to you emily to the book and 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 to this effort um i think you know we began by talking about the long arc of this particular pandemic and uh and why it is so important to really capture the stories and the narrative so i, I think we're we're, we're all really uh, indebted to you for that um, I think we're kind of coming to the to the end of the hour. Maybe maybe a, a, a last um, um, moment, a brief moment uh, from from uh, each of you. Um, Maria. Um, well, again, thank you very very much for giving me this opportunity, and thank you, uh, Emily, for your book. Um, I think you know the struggle is not over, and a lot of it is going to have to go back to being political struggle. Yeah. You know, and, you know, the, the research is there, but the politics are really tricky, both uh, internationally and in the US. We have a request, by the way, from Lisa Mills for people to turn their cameras on, um, for those of you who are um, decent, <laughs> uh, so that we can have a, a Zoom photo and, uh, Eileen, can you can you take the Zoom photo? Can you do that? I think that I can. Let's see. All how right. This works. Well, that would be great. So, um, as many uh, folks as we can. I still haven't got my little camera working, so I, you're, I'm chinless in this <laughs> particular. There we go. <laughs> right. I'm actually standing, so we have to do this pretty quickly. Uh, oh, oh yeah, Lisa's this, going this, full yeah, family. Buddy, Steve Reynolds, yay! Hey, Steve. Steve, <laughs> I'm someone who's very here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Is someone in charge of taking the picture? That's uh, yes, Eileen is going to take the picture, and Lisa's right. got Hi. the family. Beautiful. All so right, cute. everyone, say cheese. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> say access. There we go. Access. There's Ron. Hey, Ron. Hey, Ron. All right. Hey, where's Tom Quinn? Where's Tom Quinn? Tom is being shy. Tom? <laughs> no, I'm here. <laughs> I just can't get my camera on. Uh, sorry about that. Present. Uh, Mark, you'll get present. my name anyway. Hi, yes, Emily. Yes, we have your name. Great presentation. Thank you. And, and great book, really. Thank you so much. Thanks for the work that made the book. That's, that's all it is. It's a story about what you guys did. Well, what everyone did. Uh, it was a collective uh, enterprise. And I think uh, our shout outs to all of our okay. Ugandan Good. colleagues. Yeah, and we're still all working together. David, yeah. Nelson, uh, Joseph Kagai. I mean, we're still all working together. 
It is remarkable. Okay, well, the photo is done. Um, so I think, Emily, perhaps the last word to you. Oh, thank you. You know, I want to say something um, about over 50. And, and I think you're right in large part, um, Chris, but, um, you know, the book is the book is dedicated to to three of my closest friends, four of my closest friends, three of whom are Ugandan, um, all of whom were over fifty, and all of whom are women living with HIV since the nineteen nineties. And and um, somebody recently, we were talking, you know, I think it was a PEPFAR community consultation about, you know, the folks that are on ART are are going to stay on ART, and we have to find the missing people, which you know. Um, I love the civil society activists can get very funny to me about, you know, finding the 100,000 missing men, you know, like they're sort of in a, you know, truck someplace, you know what I mean? Like, where are they? Um, but but the, the trauma of living through another pandemic like this, I don't know that all of the people are gonna stay on ART, even if they can get to their clinics. I don't, I, there's, there is a mental health toll. I think Chris, we were talking about this. There's a mental health toll, these women, these people, but I'm talking about my friends, Sissy and Millie and Yvette and Lillian, to whom the book is dedicated, who are, are living through the second pandemic of their lifetimes that is that is destroying social fabric and, and really harming women and girls and all their diversities. And I, yeah, maybe I do want to end there with a personal note, which is that is that there is a there is a there is depression, there is there is enormous fear, there's enormous anxiety, these are there's huge grief, and that you know, we've always known that this was not just a biomedical context, and 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 for these these champions, my comrades, I think thinking about how we how we take care of mind and body as we move forward um, is, is all of our collective work in addition to everything else. So that's, that's my last thought. Well, inshallah, hopefully we will we'll be able to start really healing those challenges, particularly when, when we can get um, immunization going uh, in a real way on the African continent. And, uh, I think that's what's next, that's what's ahead. Well, thanks to everybody, and uh, wonderful to see everyone. I'm thank I'm, you all so yeah, much. Yeah, really wonderful responses in the chat, and um, and read this book, please. Um, to end a plague, it really is a remarkable piece of work. And uh, yes, yes, thank you, Maria. Hold it up. Hold it up. All right. <laughs> thank you, guys. All be right. well. Be safe. Yes. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody who's celebrating it, and uh, take care. Take care. Thank right. you. Bye. Bye, Bye Emily. Maria. Bye. <clears throat> Bye.